All right, happy times. Let's talk about examination of the healthy infant. Nothing like seeing a, a nice healthy infant in front of you. And uh, good care for the infant actually starts well before the infant arrives in your practice. So first of all, uh, the waiting room. You really want to set up a divide between uh, well patients and sick patients. And I've actually seen divides of well, sick, and rash patients before. Um, but you don't want it, the kids to mix together and uh, because they don't really pay much attention to uh, the germ theory of disease and they're all over one another. So therefore, uh, keep a well side and a sick side in your waiting room. Support staff is really critical uh, in doing well child care because you, you frequently have to check things like hearing, vision, these take time. So does uh, the application of vaccines and doing that correctly. So you want to have toys available, like this waiting room is a good example, seeing appropriate for uh, young kids. Having stickers goes a long, long ways to making the owies feel better and uh, the kids stop crying. Very importantly, from a medical side, uh, you're going to want to follow uh, weight and height assiduously in these kids. You also are going to want to be checking vaccine records. And one of the more flummoxing things is when you have a child, but you know, and they seem to be underweight, but you don't know their weight from two months ago, and you don't know their vaccine history, and that leads to delays in care, and therefore they're less likely to get good care, they're less likely to be vaccinated. And really, I, I found that it, is a, it takes a team to provide uh, good care, particularly to infants who require so many vaccinations. And uh, so watch the, uh, the folks who give vaccines. They should have skill in grouping together the vaccines, getting all the charting and the consents from the parents out of the way first. And then when it comes showtime to you know, hold that baby down and do the vaccines, it should be very, very efficient, all ready to go, not like fiddling with things or, oh, I've got to run out of the room again for a second. You really want to get them over with. Um, I've been very impressed with our personal uh, pediatrics practice in, in doing this. Um, anything that involves a kid, it, maybe it's a little bit harder among infants, but you can still play peekaboo with them. But, um, but I always give it the chance for young children to manipulate the stethoscope, understand it's not going to be harmful. Try to make games as you go along of looking into the ears or checking for the red reflex. Um, those can be tricky, and so therefore the more it's a game, it can be more fun for the kids and you'll get better participation. And of course, you need good communication with the family because kids can't give their own histories. So what's the usual schedule? What's recommended uh, for well child visits during that first year of life? Within three to five days after birth, I think that's a critical time to ensure that healthy habits are instituted, breastfeeding is going on, there's no evidence of jaundice, and that the home is safe and that everybody's adjusting uh, to the new addition well. And then at one month, two months, four months, six months, nine months, and a year. So a baby who was born on January 1st should have a schedule that looks something like that. How about breastfeeding? Of course, we recommend breastfeeding. It's associated with a lot of health benefits we're gonna go over. These might be on your examination. Um, at least the first six months should be exclusive breastfeeding, and uh, strong consideration should be paid to continuation of breastfeeding through one year. But even for women who stop at six months, most of these benefits I'm about to describe to you um, were among uh, women who were studied to breastfeed for at least six months. So therefore, six months is, is something that, of an achievement in of itself because it is associated with a lower risk of asthma for the infant in childhood, lower risk for obesity moving on, and thus diabetes, lower risk for serious infections such as pneumonia, and a lower risk for sudden infant death syndrome as well. For the mother, there are also some benefits. If say you have a selfish mother, she want, and she wants to know, well, what is in it for me for breastfeeding? Because it is a lot of work. Um, tremendous respect uh, for every, uh, every mother out there who breastfeeds, because I, I, I've, I've witnessed just how much at work it is. So uh, dads, you have to pitch in and you get to do everything else because um, the breastfeeding is a lot of work. And it does come with some benefits. Lower risk of ovarian and breast cancer and improved bonding between mother and infant as well. All right, what about uh, problems that you can see even very early in childhood, like right after birth with neonatal jaundice during the neonatal period? So just to recall that preterm infants are at higher risk and therefore they should be monitored every eight to 12 hours for jaundice. And that is more or less standard practice, I think, for every infant in the hospital. While we want them to room with uh, the parents and that's healthier, 
Uh, it's more better for bonding, better for initiating and, and maintaining breastfeeding versus the, the babies in a nursery. They should still be checked by, uh, by the staff for, um, for jaundice. Uh, transcutaneous bilirubin is great. It's, uh, it's non-invasive and it's about the equally useful as serum bilirubin levels. It's hard to get into exactly when to initiate treatment um, using uh, phototherapy, um, but uh, you can. there are nomograms, which I refer to, that's based on the hours uh, since birth, and it allows you to appropriately risk stratify which uh, children are at uh, risk for conicterus, which is a uncommon outcome of hyperbilirubinemia, but it can occur and it is devastating. Obviously, you want to avoid it. For patients with rising uh, bilirubin, definitely get a blood type and a Coombs test. Consider G6PD testing as well uh, for glucose-6 pyrophosphate disease because these uh, children with uh, jaundice may be at higher risk. How do you prevent uh, neonatal jaundice? Well, we know that breastfeeding can, uh, breast milk can promote jaundice uh, for a period, but that is nearly always benign. So breastfeeding in of itself uh, is helpful, up to eight to 12 breastfeeds per day. And uh, once jaundice is identified, that is not an indication of itself uh, to reduce breastfeeding. Only in severe jaundice would that be a consideration. We want to continue the breastfeeding. Um, and most cases, just remember that most cases uh, do resolve either spontaneously or uh, with phototherapy, which can be given within the hospital or at home. But uh, the, the key is careful monitoring and, and the cases that are monitored closely and of, up applying that nomogram to uh, put the patient in the right uh, category of risk and treatment, um, it's very rare to have any serious complication. So what about some concerns that parents may have during infancy? Sleep is always important because that's what the kid does most of the day. Sleep should always be, uh, the patient should always be on the back. So the baby should always be uh, face up. Um, and that's prevent sudden infant death. Uh, it's uh, you know been strange to look at uh, cribs and there's nothing in there. There's no toys. There's no bumpers around. There's no blankets uh, because you know a generation ago all that stuff was really in vogue. Now we know all those things unfortunately can promote a higher risk of SIDS and therefore should be eliminated. So really, it's just the baby. They may be swallowed in a blanket, uh, but they shouldn't have any um, any loose materials within their crib. Um, average number, average sleep, remember, it's very high, so parents should be aware that 14 to 17 hours per day is normal for news, newborns. Among infants, it's 12 to 15 hours per day. Uh, and it, of course, parents are concerned with night waking, and they want to think about, well, what's the best way? It's, it is exhausting to take care of a newborn and an infant many times, and so therefore, they're going to have lots of questions. Do try to tell them that for most infants, uh, night waking by age six months is going to be pretty infrequent. It's rare to have uh, a child who's waking up two or three times per night. Usually it's you know, along the lines of maybe once or twice per night. And it's really hard to, to recommend one form of training uh, versus another. So uh, there's the model of care which just says let the baby cry. Um, and generally I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that at all. Um, for the first uh, couple months of life, but uh, after that it might be uh, more of a reasonable approach versus the more supportive model of going in and uh, comforting the baby um, and, you know, and, and doing a feed when the on demand. Um, either one of these techniques can promote parental anxiety and burnout, which is not good. And I think it's best to have a framework for what you want to do, uh, but keep it flexible. Uh, because certainly when your child has a fever, it's, uh, you're not going to ignore that baby who's crying, or they might be in some other form of distress. Um, and, and, and likewise, you don't want to be rushing into uh, you know, every time they're, they're crying when they're you know, 15 months old. So uh, avoiding the extremes and kind of keeping it flexible uh, based on your child's condition is important. And, and one thing that really helps is, of course, a bedtime routine of uh, keeping things calm, soothing, and that sets things up nicely for when they hit older ages, you know, one year and beyond, um, where they understand, okay, it's time to settle down, it's time for bedtime. What about pacifier use? That's a big question as well. Actually, pacifier use can improve the risk of SIDS through six months, but over time, it's also associated with a higher risk of otitis media, 
Uh, kids who use pacifiers more often tend to wheeze more, and it's associated with uh, uh, dental malocclusion and, and dental abnormalities over time. Bottom line with pacifier use is, uh, again, I have young children. I can personally vouch for how valuable it can be, particularly uh, for younger infants. Um, but by the time six months uh, happens, it's, it's time for the aliens to start abducting uh, the pacifiers uh, from around the room. And suddenly they just start disappearing. There's not as many as they, there once uh, were. So really try to wean off the pacifier, um, certainly. And you could start at six months is perfectly reasonable. For vaccinations, um, there's, there's too many vaccinations to describe individually, but we certainly try to stick uh, to what's recommended from the Centers for Disease Control. Really try to stay away from vaccine delays. Um, the typical excuse is, my uh, baby had a fever three days ago, they're getting over a cold, I don't want to get them sick, so can we just wait on my vaccines? Uh, um, you know, oh, that's so many vaccines, why don't we split them up, we'll give two this time, and I swear I'll come back in a month, we'll do two next time too. Um, all of these things are associated with not completing the vaccination schedule. And so I really try to discourage that. Try to keep the kids on schedule unless they have a real contraindication for vaccines that day. Keep them on schedule. They're, at the end of the day, they're going to be better protected and you'll save the parent a lot of time and going back and forth and, you know, between visits. Um, you can reassure parents there was this potential association between vaccinations such as MMR and autism. Uh, that's been completely disproven. There's no link between vaccinations and autism. And in, in kind of going the opposite way, outbreaks of um, preventable uh, infectious illnesses such as pertussis and measles are leading states, uh, like my own in California, uh, to create legislation to mandate um, vaccination among children in public schools. So parents need to be aware of that. Failure to thrive. This is where I'm going to close in our discussion of infants. Um, it's a scary uh, potential diagnosis. It's still, it, yet it remains pretty uncommon. Um, there's different definitions, but the most common one used is when the, the birth, when, I'm sorry, when the weight and the child's uh, body mass index are lower than the fifth percentile. Also, it's a concern when they cross two major percentile lines uh, for weight. Um, and therefore, you can consider, consider using multiple criteria, including um, their length and their body mass index and their weight together. Uh, so in terms of causes, uh, first, the first thing I do when I see uh, a baby with abnormal um, length or abnormal weight is recheck it. That's right. So babies are squirming, they, it's, and it's amazing. Uh, a few grams make a big difference uh, and can, can push the baby up or down, over or under a line. And so the first thing to do is, is recheck it when it seems abnormal. And that resolves a problem, I'd say, about 75% of the time. Um, for patients with, with true failure to thrive is using one of those definitions. Just remember that, and this is important for clinical care as well as exam, that uh, social issues cause the vast majority of cases of uh, failure to thrive. And particularly when the child isn't having a lot of symptoms, mostly respiratory, feeding, or gastrointestinal uh, symptoms, then it's almost always social issues. But you do want to perform lab testing uh, in, in cases of failure to thrive where you can't find a, um, a social issue at, at, at heart there. And of course, you're going to refer those kids to a social work or child protective services because uh, they're going to be doing investigations within the patient's home. Um, the uh, typical uh, way to start up a workup for failure to thrive with laboratory, CBC, comprehensive metabolic panel, urinalysis, and culture, along with a sed rate and a, and a thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, but many, many cases don't even uh, get to there because you're doing a thorough assessment for those social causes. So what we learned today was the schedule of, uh, of how to see an infant over that first year of life and some of the key questions that parents may have and the key uh, factors for keeping kids well during that time. Thanks very much.